So, so thank you, Mona, and thank you, Central Track and UTD, UTD for sponsoring Central Track, and Central Track for uh, upholding the uh, visual arts standards here at, uh, uh, within the community, with the lower Dallas community. Uh, and I'd like to, sure Laura is mean. here, <laughs> who is the, one of the managing directors, uh, Rawhide, uh, is uh, Fontno is not here tonight, but uh, <laughs> he's usually running rough, rough shot over there. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, Peter Doroshenko for uh, and his staff and the board for helping out and lending us this place and for keeping the uh, Dallas Contemporary Art Party going. As, uh, they Can you have, also give a shout out to Autumn Hill, who's sitting over there, Autumn who Hill may have facilitated this Aaron, session. <laughs> Thank you. So staff, all the staff, I mean everybody, I mean it's a, it's a big effort to keep this going and, uh, and we appreciate having this venue. So that said, uh, I'll introduce our, uh, our, I wouldn't say, <laughs> I just don't want to use that word panel. This, uh, Conversation. Our artist. How about our artist? Our artist. Uh, How about that? And uh, I'll start with Vicki because I've known her the longest, uh, since maybe 79 or 1980, where we were, uh, she was working at the West Dallas Girls Club at that time and, uh, and working at the, in the CETA program and we, yes, and uh, she was, uh, we were kind of the rebel rousers and she was working her side of the street and I was working mine. Uh, she was in West Dallas at the time. I was in Oak Cliff. She probably, I think you lived in Oak Cliff. No? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Oak Cliff. Not the hip part. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Vicki has, uh, she, was, uh, she was a much better talker than I was. So, uh, and she has been a great spokesperson for the arts in Dallas. Uh, she's a civic leader as well. First of all, an artist. Uh, and she has uh, been uh, working with the Dallas Cultural Affairs. And she runs the uh, South Dallas Cultural Center. And has done that for a number of years and really made lots of things, exciting things happen there. But uh, I'm finally glad to see her get her due with this Nasher project and the recognition that her artwork certainly deserves. Uh, and so, thank you. Uh, Janiel Engelstad, who uh, I've just gotten to know. Uh, I had her come talk to my class this last semester and learned a little more about her. Uh, so look her up. Uh, lots of lots more than I could ever tell you has gone on uh, in her background as she was mentored by Felix Gonzalez Torres and in that program she was an early uh, she's a photographer artist who uh, been uh, an activist uh, curator scholar I mean you name it uh, she's a little bit of everything. Uh, she was part of the early, early <laughs> Act <laughs> Up, <laughs> Act Up, and Spark, and uh, so she comes with uh, lots of stripes uh, to this conversation. And uh, she's now the uh, she's co-founder of Map Make Art with Purpose, and she's hopefully uh, the founder. Pardon? <laughs> the founder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the founder of uh, Make Art With Purpose. And, and she has uh, certainly uh, is creating an exposition of gestures of social practice now uh, that, you know, is, we have to discuss whether curatorial, uh, cur curator purview is, is an art form. I guess it, it is, so we'll see. We can have that and then Rick Lowe, who uh, I've known about for a long time, uh, certainly a legend, uh, and uh, now I am uh, working with him and learning a lot more, and I actually really know him uh, a little more in uh, that field of practice, and 
He's a great mentor and certainly puts a humanist face uh, in, a, in a different perspective than I ever imagined uh, working on this challenging project with Vickery Meadows. Let him talk a little bit about that. And I know I just keep thinking uh, every time I read an article and hear that uh, Project Row House that, that you must be thinking, you know, that at some point uh, on, you know, on your headstone there's going to be <laughs> Rick, Rick Lowhouse project. Uh, anyway, uh, and I'll let him talk a little bit about tonight about uh, the uh, Vickery Meadows translation project. So um, I've asked them each to just give a brief little, uh, um, a little address to your projects that are happening now and turn it over to you and then we'll do a little questioning and invite everyone in the group. So, Vicki, uh, would you like to? Well, um, I think the project you're referring to is the National the Project. Na and I, and oh, I meant okay. to say. Because you know I got a few projects. <laughs> um, so, the National Project that I'm working on, um, I got to choose because I'm the native of course, you know, I'm not really a native, but you know, as much as I get to be one. I'm here, so I knew this community very well, and I got to choose where I wanted to do my project and what I wanted to do with that project, and they trusted that that would be okay. Um, for a while now, I've been uh, interested in the whole idea of how institutions close up shop and then disappear from both the uh, cultural landscape and the memory of a city. And Bishop College was one such institution that I felt uh, this had happened to. And for those of you who are not familiar, Bishop, Bishop College was an HBCU, a historically black college or university here in Dallas, um, had transplanted itself from Marshall, Texas in 1961. So when I came here in 1980, um, it was actually in the beginning years of its decline. But prior to that, there was an awful lot that it did to contribute to black culture in the city. And because of the way that it went out, which was you know, under this cloud of, of disgrace because of mismanagement and blah, 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 blah. You know, we all know what happens when schools don't have enough money. Um, people stopped talking about it. And even the alums who had gone and had a good time and been, you know, really uh, a big part of energizing the black arts community in Dallas, went silent. And so my feeling was, my, my, my work is always about reclamation of memory, reclamation of history, um, revisiting uh, not so pleasant uh, times in our history. It seemed like a perfect fit for what I do as an artist anyway and something that I felt this community needed, which was a revisit uh, Bishop College. So I got involved with some of the alumni who I, a lot of these people I didn't even know went to Bishop because that's how silent the conversation had gotten around the school. Um, but most of the major musicians that we think of in this town who were jazz musicians were Bishop grads. Um, a lot, you may not know this, but Dallas Black Dance Theater got started on that campus. The Museum of African American Life and Culture, which we now know as the African American Museum, got started on that campus. Uh, there was a very vibrant literary community, uh, Imani Pomoja, who no longer is here, but she was a major force in that, Leo Hassan, who some of you know here, uh, he was there. And so all these people were products of this incredible school. So I decided I was going to create 15 cultural markers that would basically illuminate that past. And they, with some uh, conversation of depth, I managed to allow, get allowed to put it on the Paul Quinn campus, which is where Bishop College was. So there's an existing HBCU that inhabits the footprint of this HBCU that I am referring to. Um, and, it, you know, you could see where there might be some consternation there. You know, Paul Quinn is trying to establish itself. You know, do they really want some other college that no longer exists to be 
the big focus of that. You know, so you can see where the president was having a bit of a challenge saying yes to me. But he finally began to understand that this was important because the students on his campus didn't even know anything about Bishop College, and they should have. You know. So these, pla these markers will be on the campus. Originally, I was looking at putting them where these buildings existed, where these things happened, and then I found out that most of the buildings had been torn down. And so I realized that it really wasn't about the buildings anyway. It was about the people in those buildings that made this stuff happen, the faculty. Uh, the president, who was a Renaissance man and who everybody acknowledges was the reason why all of the arts existed on that campus, whereas in most HBCUs you might have a good music department, you might get some visual art, but the idea that you'd have theater, literary arts, and all the rest of it was usually not the case, especially not in a small college-based HBCU. So um, that's, that's what I did. I created these, these pieces that are art pieces. They're not like if you're going on a you know, nature trail and you see those markers. It's not like that kind of information. Uh, it's not that literal. But there is, because my work always involves text, there is some text involved. Um, but that's more text that I've pulled from uh, sources about the college, stuff that I wanted to say about the college, uh, quotes from people on the faculty about the college. It's more that kind of thing than it is any kind of uh, real factual information about uh, programs, per se. But I did include an app on this thing because that's what people do. <laughs> so the young people told me. Um, and I did that really because there was all that information that even though I didn't want to put it on the piece, I did want people to have access to it. So the app does have a documentary that I had made of me in my process, as well as interviews with alums and um, that kind of thing. Uh, slideshow of all these photographs and stuff that we gathered. Um, articles that I found, or well, my researchers found, that we are putting up on that. A cultural timeline so people will understand what happened when. So all that's available on the app. And then there's a website for those who don't want to download an app. Um, and then for those that don't have computers or smartphones, I'm creating a DVD that will be housed at the public library in that neighborhood so that those people can also see what was going on. Because, you know, the people in the neighborhood don't know what, what you know, Bishop's gone. So, you know, and it's been gone since 88. So all those people after 88, they don't even know about the school. So that's my project. <laughs> Well, Bishop was founded in 18, uh, 1875 or something like that but, that, but it was in Marshall, Texas. It moved to Dallas in 1961 because integration, they didn't want to integrate, so you bring a black college in, you don't have to. That's the, that's the long and the short of it. That's another story. Yeah, a whole other story. <laughs> that's another panel. There he is. So. Let's do that panel tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk, about, let's talk about let's talk about racial why equity tonight. Yeah. <laughs> a long night. <laughs> <laughs> How many beers you got? <laughs> so, Janiel. Um. So today launches Map 2013. Yay, yeah, is right. <laughs> <laughs> um. MAP 2013 is the first project that is an outgrowth of a website called Make Art with Purpose, which is an idea I had a few years ago when I was lecturing at different places around the world uh, at conferences that would have people from different organizations and different backgrounds and different disciplines. Um, and specifically one in DC on climate change, where I was one of the few artists who was talking. And I realized that a lot of the people who were from government and NGOs and science and business leaders had no idea that artists were working uh, in these fields, that they were actually working in, in, in a way that they weren't just taking pictures of polluted sites and then putting them in a gallery but they were actually going in and figuring out solutions to problems or suggesting solutions as problems. And they were using their training and knowledge and skills as artists to do this, and that this was part of their artistic practice. So this was kind of before Creative Time launched their whole, their whole website and Creative Time, their, their journal 
aspect of what they're doing now, which is fabulous. If you don't know about it, I highly recommend going to that. Um, and so I decided to create a website that houses some of these artist projects from around the world. And, um, and also started, I actually take my practice as a community artist, <laughs> which, you know, you have the social practice, and actually formalize it into a nonprofit. Because for two decades, I had been partnering with nonprofits to get my own work done because I'm not a walking 501c3. Well, now I am. So I can apply for my own grants, really. And, and create these partnerships, right? And so I did that in San Francisco because I got funding to do it there. And I was here, but I went there, which I have been here for 13 years, but this is actually in the last year and a half, the first time in that 13 years I've ever worked in Dallas. I've kind of worked outside and come back in and out. So after starting it in San Francisco, the website and doing a few projects, small projects, I decided to do this larger project that invited artists to, to engage these issues, and I decided to do it here because I felt Dallas was really a place where something exciting could happen. Things have been changing here. We have, you know, a lot of the people in this room are actually the people who are changing the city tonight, and they're, um, they're farming, they're doing projects, they're, you know, I don't have to tell a lot of you guys this. So, so it's an exciting time to be here and think about doing this kind of work that engages issues, that builds partnerships. And so I began by inviting a few MAP artists who were from uh, outside of the Texas area and a few local artists and then started, and then started to go, you know, peddle my wares. I went to this one and said, how about this project? And we talked and talked until we found the right project. And I went to the DMA, et cetera, and, all, and ended up with 40 different organizations and uh, 35 organizations, 40 projects, and 60 artists. More than half of them are local. And uh, between now and November, you can go out into the community, uh, everywhere from Denton to Dallas to Mesquite to Fort Worth, and I've got, I brought my propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> Up there is a, a program guide, and you'll be able to often engage in this work, um, participate in helping to create the work, um, and explore issues around uh, the environment, climate change, censorship, immigration, racial equity, um, all these things, which I put under the banner of it's really all about um, social justice. So that's what's happening. All right. Well, <clears throat> I want to first, I think first I need to um, thank the Nasher uh, Sculpture Center for actually uh, inviting me to do this project because I, I don't often work with museum institutions. Actually, it's almost 20 years, almost 20 years now since the last museum I worked with on a project like this. I worked with uh, L.A. Mocha back in 96 and started something that became Watts House Project. And, um, and the world has changed a lot since then. Uh, the, the relationship that I've been able to kind of foster with the NASA has been really, it's been amazingly easy to be able to do this kind of project with them, which is kind of surprising because I hear other artists who are struggling all the time with, uh, with uh, museums in order to get their projects going. But, <clears throat> so the project that I, that I was, well, I didn't really propose anything to uh, <laughs> Because I can't, the way that I work, it's hard to propose something. It's hard to just kind of, you know, say, oh, as I said, the way that I work, it's hard for me to just project out what it is I want to do. What I have to do is I have to experience a place and find the moment in which it uh, seems appropriate to engage. And my first, in involvement here was to go to, uh, actually Vicki suggested that, that on my site visit they take me to Vickery Meadow. And when I went there the first day, it seemed like such an odd thing. But I knew there must have been something there because Vicki suggested it. And, and she's, usually, she's usually spot on. But when I, when I arrived there, I saw that always spot on? Usually. <laughs> 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 But it was, um, I mean, it was, it was a very familiar kind of place, you know, high density apartment complexes, 1970 style apartment complexes, which was not interesting at all to me. 
But, um, but after, you know, kind of circling around a bit and seeing why she suggested that I go there because of all, this, all the diversity of people from all over the world living in that place. And, um, and so I started to think about it. And the things that start, kept coming to me was that as I talked to people outside of the neighborhood about Vickery Meadow, most people said that it was two things came up, poverty and crime. You know, that just came up over and over and over and over. And then I start to think about that if that's the identity of the neighborhood, what chance does it have to be of any value to the people that live there? So then the question is, how do you find value in a place that most people don't see it? Well, the obvious thing is that if there's all this cultural diversity, and in America we claim that cultural diversity is a valuable thing, then why are people like not attributing that cultural diversity to being something positive in that neighborhood and only just talking about the uh, <coughs> poverty and, and crime. So, so I went on a journey to figure it out, you know, figure out, so how can you make, or how can that cultural diversity become something positive? The first glimpse I got of it was at a, uh, something called a mom's lunch that a couple of organizations were doing, um, the um, International Refugee Committee and the uh, Vickery Meadow Youth Development Foundation, yeah. So they were having this thing called Mom's Lunch. And what they would do is they'd have four or five different groups of women, women from different cultures, sitting in a room, having lunch, trying to figure out how to relate to each other and understand each other's culture. And it was, it was such a magical moment, you know, to see these women, it's about four or five women from each group. There were translators all around. And so just sitting there watching, it was just amazing. It was like one of the most amazing theater pieces. And I felt like I was a privileged audience member, right, to be able to see that. And so I left there thinking, that's the power right there, the power of people coming together from different you know, places that don't understand each other, but they're, they're trying. They're, they're grappling with their lives and trying to figure it out. So, so I left there thinking that if, I could, if you could do that in a public way, that would be a very powerful Piece. But of course, you can't exploit people. You know, you can't just bring an audience of people to watch people deal with their stuff. <laughs> that's not, that's, that's not a, 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 a cool thing to do in my book. Although people do it. <laughs> so, I, so I have to figure out, you know, so how do you do that? And how do you take, give that experience some kind of public form? And, uh, and so from there, I just continued hanging out in the neighborhood, driving through, and just trying to listen and, ob and observe, observe some possibilities. And there were a couple things that hit me. One was that there was a little um, Latino man walking down the street with uh, a pole that had candy and apples and um, cotton candy on it. He was selling on the street. Just in a, on a residential street, not a lot going on, but he was out there trying to sell stuff. And then there was somebody else that pulled up a truck and they were selling something off the back of the truck. Then it hit me that the challenge of people getting together in that neighborhood, was the challenge was based on the fact that there was no avenue, no vehicle through which they could do that. And markets are generally the way that people kind of come together anyway. I mean, when we all travel to places we don't understand, you know, you get to the market and you start buying stuff and you just kind of start to communicate even without having common language. And so, so that was the thing that kind of got me thinking about this idea of a market. Then I had something to, to go on, right? To, that there was this idea that people could come together in this kind of almost theatrical way in a market, but not just as uh, subjects for people to observe, but they're participants in it because they're trying to make things for the market. So that was the, the beginning. And then I had to go through this whole long process of figuring out, so how do you do the market? How do you make this happen? Well it became obvious that I needed to have more people involved. So once again, I went to Vicki, <laughs> my Dallas Connect, and, uh, and I asked her, I said, you know, so who should I, who could I talk to in Dallas that could connect me with artists and so on and so forth? So she connected me to uh, Greg and uh, Michael Kors over at SMU, and, and, uh, and I held a meeting and I talked, talked to them about this idea. Everybody seemed really interested. So then the next step, I said, well, you guys invite artists. And then we got you know, more and more artists kind of coming. coming. And, uh, and it just seemed like something that was 
a natural to, uh, to, to pull up. Another part of it, though, that, that happened that kind of put it in perspective, and I, I would, we can talk about some of these detailed things about what's important to a project to me um, uh, as we go along in the conversation, but i just say right now that it's always important to have uh, leaders that, may, that can invest themselves into the project in a, in a, in a, in a real meaningful way. And, uh, and I was very lucky to early on find uh, Sarah Mercuria, who was actually uh, working, she worked at UTD, and she put herself forward to uh, be the project manager of the project. And so once she came in, then we were able to kind of corral a team of people and, uh, and kind of flesh it out from there. It turned into something that is uh, the three core components. One is an artist in residence program. Uh, the other one is these weekly workshops that we do every week to uh, help people train to produce things for the market, and then there's the market part. But before I go on too far, though, I should acknowledge the translation team members that are here. Do you guys stand? Uh, there are a few of them here. So, so these guys are all the people that um, it's, it's kind of a project like this also gets a little tricky at a certain point because you know I've learned to live with this with project row houses in Houston is that you know my my tombstone would be the one that says you know Rick Low row houses or whatever but you know there are all these other people that actually do it and make it happen and so it gets really tricky at a point in a project when you can conceptualize it but then you build a team around it and then the team is actually doing the project. Right? And then so as artists, kind of sitting back trying to figure out how to keep it conceptually framed within, um, within a kind of a complex way that gives it, gives it all the layers that is different than what each individual brings to it, but it's meaningful as a whole you know, when you put it all together. So um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about it for right now. But we're getting geared up for the market that opens uh, October 19th from 1 to 4. four. 1 to 4. Yeah. Maybe till 5. All the, <laughs> Maybe till 5. No. All the unveilings are going to be on that day. Right, mm -hmm. right. And that, so Vicky's Yeah, all the unveilings are going to be on from, ten, from 9 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know, they said 3, but I guess you're going longer as usual. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think. Uh, Good bad is going till ten. Hmm. So okay. So we can end up there. <laughs> <laughs>